So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Masoud Hussain and uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Vanessa Raymond today. She's well known to many of you, but for those who don't know her, she's a, a consultant psychiatrist and senior clinical researcher at the Warnford. And she's also the R&D director of the Oxford Health NHS Trust. Uh, and Vanessa, in her capacities, is associate director of DP UK, Dementia Platforms UK, and the NIHR Dementia and Mental Health Lead for the Thames Valley and South Midlands Clinical Research Network. And today, she's going to be telling us about the Deep and Frequent Phenotyping Study, which is a, an important initiative, a national initiative, and uh, how that overlaps with the new dementia mission. Vanessa. Thank you very much, Masood, and thanks for that introduction. So, uh, as you said, I'm going to give you a little bit of update of where things are with the Deep and Frequent Phenotyping Study. Uh, people who work in Oxford may have heard of this study um, over the last few years, uh, and I'll explain why this has been around for so long, but why the need is still so very great, and actually how this overlaps with some of the aims of the new Dementia Mission. And also, I'm going to touch a little bit on how this feeds into uh, really exciting developments in clinical services that are happening at the moment. Uh, I'm just having problems moving my slides on, so I'm going to stop sharing for just one moment. Unfortunately, I've had this problem before with Zoom, so apologies, and I'm going to try and do this again. Okay. So these curves, Jack curves, everyone will be very familiar with, I'm sure, which represent the fact that we know that in the preclinical and prodromal phases of Alzheimer's disease, so this is when people are cognitively normal and they're going through the phase of mild cognitive impairment, there's actually an awful go lot going on in, in terms of brain structure uh, that we would not easily detect. Uh, in terms of things like memory tests. And if we're going to think about uh, developing disease modifying drugs, the likelihood is that we need to be aiming at the primary prevention stage uh, or possibly ultimately in the primary prevention stage. And in order to identify people who are going to benefit from those drugs, um, we're going to have to find better ways of um, uh, picking up those early biomarker changes. What that means, of course, is if you're going to have to identify people earlier in that clinical pathway is you've got to uh, screen potentially much larger numbers. You've got to really deeply and accurately phenotype them. Um, and you've got to understand the biology and the trajectory of that early disease much more effectively and develop modeling strategies to understand that. And then ultimately also communicate this to patients in the public. If people are going to take these disease modifying drugs earlier, they need to understand why their level of risk has been identified and what could be done to manage that. So why do we need deep and frequent phenotyping? So I've, I've already highlighted one point, which is that we need better biomarkers, more efficient biomarkers to identify those early target pathologies, and that the drugs uh, that we're developing for disease modification are most likely to be effective in the early stages of the disease. So that's the area we've got to target. The other thing is that proof of concept, so early clinical trials when we're developing those drugs are very challenging. Because historically, the outcome measures we, do, we have used for clinical trials in this group have been very much based on memory assessments. But if you're dealing with a group that are pre-developing uh, memory problems, so preclinical, or in that prodromal phase where they may have very mild memory problems, those are not always the most effective ways of tracking response to drugs. And so that makes the kind of short-term, modest size proof of concept trials nigh on impossible. And that's really what the DFP study was set up to uh, address. I think another sideline, which we'll, I'll come back to when I talk about the dementia mission, is the fact that in the UK, um, we are not doing well in terms of uh, trial uh, trials that are coming through um, and in terms of recruitment and our set up uh, procedures and times. So uh, we're recruited in, in 21 to 22, almost half the number of people that we did in 2017 and 18, so a drop off of 44%. And in the same period, the number of trials per year running through the UK fell by 41% as well. And in fact, even if you move on a couple of years, uh, February this year, with just over 4,000 uh, dementia trials registered internationally, only 7% were running in the UK. 
So there's obviously a great need to develop better biomarkers for trials, but I think there's also a great need for us to be doing this in the UK and to using those technologies uh, to stratify people for trials, but also, as I mentioned earlier, um, help develop uh, more efficient diagnostic pathways and clinical services. So this um, uh, diagram really just quantifies where we are with biomarkers. And again, most of this information will be really familiar to everybody on this webinar. Really in the uh, mid 90s was when the first time that we started to being able to identify CSF, uh, amyloid uh, tau and biomarkers. And the real things, the real kind of changes that, that came about in terms of quantifying the uh, identification of early disease came about with the establishment of the ATN system. So this was being able to look at biomarkers that quantify amyloid tau and neurodegeneration and look at how those different levels would interact to predict the likelihood of somebody having underlying Alzheimer's disease. And of course, now we have um, other exploratory biomarkers in development like GFAP and NFL that hopefully give us a much greater overall picture of somebody's likelihood of having underlying disease and also potentially the ability to track changes in that pathology and response to drugs. So we're possibly at this point now where we may be able to develop specific biomarkers for particular points on those jack curves. So if we're looking at changes in amyloid, for instance, if we're looking at changes in tau and other areas of pathology like neurodegeneration, uh, sorry, inflammation, there may be particular biomarkers that we can now target at these specific changes. So where are we with biomarkers overall? So uh, PET and CSF still are the main mainstay of biomarkers that we use in trials. There are now three amyloid tra uh, tracers available uh, in the UK, Europe and the US, including um, appropriate use criteria for clinical uh, diagnosis. Um, obviously, tau tracers have also been developed over the last few years and seem to correlate really well with cognitive and functional outcomes. And tau tracers have now, tau tracer has now been approved in the US for imaging to diagnose cognitive impairment. And these may be very useful, particularly for monitoring that progression of disease and response to disease modifying drugs. In terms of CSF, we know that beta amyloid 4240 seems to be highly concordant with PET uh, data, and it may be that amyloid abnormalities detected in the CSF um, are particularly useful at identifying earlier disease. Again, we have appropriate use criteria for clinical use, and certainly the FDA and the EMA have encouraged further study of CSF biomarkers. However, I think the real game changer in terms of both uh, the, trying to make those proof of concept trials more achievable and what can feed into clinical services is blood biomarkers. And the huge benefit of that is obviously accessibility. And it does seem that plasma beta amyloid 4240 does reflect levels within PET. And more recently, uh, the development of various plasma uh, tau assay assays seem to suggest that these may be very useful for screening predicting risk and tracking progression and monitoring treatment response. And then as I've mentioned, there are other biomarkers emerging now like NFL and GAP that maybe will detect people who are more likely to decline uh, more quickly uh, and uh, uh, they're very early changes in pathology, but those are really too um, early to be used at scale. Another thing to bear in mind, though, apart from the kind of mainstream biomarkers, is that we know there are very large numbers of people who have comorbid pathologies, such as vascular disease, and we don't really have good biomarkers that we're using at scale at the moment to detect vascular lesions um, or, or uh, alpha-synuclein and other misfolded proteins. The other thing is a lack of more real-world data. So we're definitely lacking data around biomarkers in the over-85s. Actually, probably in the at-risk middle-aged, so those people that are not in clinical services at the moment, but may well be at risk of developing clinical disease and more diverse underrepresented populations. I think another thing to mention when we talk about biomarkers is digital technology. And again, this is a growing area. We're recognizing that digital technology may be really helpful with early detection and again, tracking progress and monitoring response. And from a clinical perspective, may give us a really useful feedback loop to clinics. Digital technologies uh, have the possibility of being quite non-intrusive and that you could test people at home 
which definitely could mean a greater ecological validity and allow us to access people that wouldn't normally come to sites and clinics to do trials. But obviously, when you're talking about digital advises, devices, there are huge issues or there can be huge issues in terms of data sharing, privacy, um, how accessible they are, how reliable they are for uh, participants to use and costs. I'm not going to go into the detail on this slide, but it really just summarizes where we are in terms of the AT and N biomarkers and also these additional X biomarkers that are under exploration and where they may be used in terms of diagnosis, prognosis and monitoring. The bottom box really highlights a lot of the pros and cons, which I've kind of already touched on, which is obviously for PET particularly, there is an access issue, there's a cost issue, uh, there's a radioactivity issue. Um, uh, exposure issue. Um, so for CSF and blood, you don't get the same localization data, uh, and there could be issues in terms of how samples are stored and collected. But I think the way forward for us to deliver um, efficient proof of concept trials will be very much focused on blood and other novel biomarkers. So I'm now going to come on and actually talk about the DFP study. So as I said, this was established because of those because of a lack of viable outcome measures for use in these early trials. And there's obviously an awful lot of other studies that have and are doing this um, in terms of deep and frequent phenotyping. But I think DFP still probably has a set of biomarkers that are being assessed more frequently and more in a in a, um, a, a larger number of biomarkers than other studies. And so the aims of the study are to identify an optimal set of markers, both for stratification and selection into trials, and to identify markers that are suitable for target engagement uh, and tracking. Uh, as a sideline, I think DFP will still create probably the largest single cohort of very well characterized prodromal AD participants and provide a platform for those biosamples to be used for further research. It's supported by the MRC and NIHR. A pilot study ran from 2014 to 16 and the main study started in 2019 and it is supported by DP UK. And again, just to clarify the objectives of the main study, it's to identify a set of markers that tracks disease, but also predicts disease change in people with this very early um, Alzheimer's disease. So what did the pilot study do? So the pilot study was there given the breadth of assessments and the frequency of assessments we were anticipating people doing. We did a pilot study which accept, uh, assessed the feasibility and acceptability of doing this range of assessments with participants and also the practicality, the logistics of whether we could deliver this. Uh, the pilot study was uh, included assessments over six months across six centres and there were predetermined criteria for feasibility success which was implementation of all 10 phenotypic measures with a greater than 80% completion rate. And 32 participants were screened to come into this uh, pilot study. And on top of there was, there was a more qualitative angle, which looked at acceptability for the participants, which included questionnaires, a focus group and follow up interviews without, with the Alzheimer's Society. And we were able to uh, collect this acceptability data in 91% of people who came through and they were asked about the level of comfort of doing these various assessments and would they be willing to enter a similar study in the future. The positive thing was that it was a really high degree of acceptability on all measures and overall participants reported their experience as good or excellent, including the uh, CSF testing, which is obviously always a concern for people coming through trials and the focus group was useful as it gave us some specific recommendations for the main study such as shortening the length of the PET scan. And this diagram just shows you exactly what uh, what was completed in terms of the different modalities and you can see the kind of orange and yellow bars are the areas that were either declined or incomplete um, and you can see the areas that probably struggled the most to get uh, their assessments completed were CSF and PET, but still we were able to hit um, uh, the 80% 80, 80 mark overall. So again, just to confirm for the main study, this is now a multi-center repeated measure study uh, in prodromal Alzheimer's disease and early preclinical and preclinical disease uh, using established and novel biomarkers to establish a set for measuring outcome in proof of concept trials. In order to make this as efficient as possible, we're recruiting 
by and large through existing parent cohorts, although we are reaching out through social media um, and uh, clinics to a certain extent, although we particularly don't want to be recruiting people who have a well-established uh, clinical diagnosis at this point. And the study's recruiting uh, men and women aged over 60, um, uh, and they either have um, uh, an absence of AD pathology or have AD pathology and are recruited in a four to one ratio accordingly. So the participation recruitment is done via screening funnel. So the first step is if we have previous uh, cognitive data on these people because they're in existing cohorts, we invite people with subclinical impairment. So that's one to one and a half standard deviations below the mean on a cognitive test. We then ask everybody to do an online cognitive test, which is the paired associates, associates learning task. And we've picked that because it's very hippocampal dependent. It declines in Alzheimer's disease and seems to predict conversion from mild cognitive impairment to dementia. So enrollment is based on uh, performance uh, on the on the paired associates learning task, again, at one and a half to one standard deviations below the mean um, for people who are in the uh, patient group um, and half to one standard deviation below the mean for people who have no apparent impairment, again, in a four to one ratio. When people are enrolled, they then go into a screening uh, assessment where their APOE status is established. And again, we use that to enrich the cohort so that they are invited to a second screening where their amyloid positivity is assessed. And again, that is another step in the funnel where people are, uh, are, are recruited on a four to one ratio. So this is what that actually looks like. It's quite a complicated um, a screening procedure. So we identify people over 60. Um, they go through this pre-screen call into their screening visit um, where we will uh, assess their cognitive um, uh, um, status. They then go in for APOE screening and subsequently uh, for amyloid screening. And you can see the various stages at which that four to one ratio kicks in. And this is what it looks like for people who come from existing cohorts. So our main source of recruitment to date has been UK Biobank, and they sent invites out to people um, based on their age uh, and purely are they accessible to a DFP centre. So we don't do any pre-screening above that. And then they come via um, uh, uh, the same pathway as, as the previous uh, slide. So these is the range of assessments we're doing in the DFP study. So we have molecular assessments, CSF, blood, urine, saliva, tear, um, uh, sample collection, imaging, both PET and MR. We're doing MEG and EEG, ophthalmology, a cognitive battery, range of wearable and device assessments, and um, collection of biosamples to established um, IPSC lines. And the visits are very frequent. They're every two months over a year. And you can see the sites here that we initially identified. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to progress with the Newcastle site as they were really struggling to get some of these assessments off the ground. And we're in the process now of setting up uh, the King's site. This diagram just highlights how complicated it is to get this study off the ground. So that was one of the reasons why there was this quite big delay between the pilot study that ended in 2016 and the main study that started in 2019. Because, you know, if you're trying to coordinate things like MEG visits, PET um, and MR and ophthalmology across this kind of range of sites, you can see that we've had to reach out to additional sites like York uh, and Imanova in London that help provide some of these assessments. Um, and so I think that plus uh, getting the screening procedures off the ground with UK Biobank were the main reasons why this took so very long to set up but also maybe highlights what we need to get more efficient at at the UK. We, we have these network of sites and facilities. We need to make them work more efficiently together. This is what the assessment schedule looks like. I'm not going to go through this. This is a really complicated slide. But again, you can just see the complexity of visits that have to be coordinated across multiple sites. And you can see that all of the visits are occurring pretty much on a, a, a two monthly basis throughout the 12 months. So coming on to the individual study procedures, which I kind of alluded to, but just to give a wee bit more detail, uh, in terms of clinical assessments, we're obviously asking about medical history, medication use, um, and doing a routine physical exam and vital uh, sign testing. 
Uh, we do a range of assessments around cognition that are used clinically, like the CDR, the MMSE, um, uh, an ADL test, um, and uh, self-reported scales looking at depression, anxiety, and sleep. We're also asking about history of head injury via the brain injury screening questionnaire and getting a sense of pre-morbid IQ via the National Adult Reading Test. In terms of cognition, we very deliberately wanted to use a battery that uh, allowed us to compare data from DFP with other uh, studies. So we're using the EPAD cognition battery. So for people who don't know, that's the European Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease uh, Consortium that sadly ended a couple of years ago, but we have a lot of data from the people that were recruited through that. So we're using the same platform and you can see the tests here that are detailed that we're using. So the R bands, um, again, paired associate the learning, um, supermarket trolley test and the Four Martins task. On top of that, People also are assessed using uh, a Cantab battery via a tablet. And again, you can see the tasks that are included um, in that. In terms of PET, um, there were some initial concerns that because we wanted to do amyloid and tau in the same study, that could be challenging. But as I said, the pilot study demonstrated that dual PET imaging on adjacent scanning days is definitely possible. And as I mentioned, PET amyloid will be used as a primary method or is being used for screening uh, and is completed once during the study. Um, and based on, again, the uh, data from the pilot study, we've been able to uh, get the PET acquisition time down to 60 minutes. Um, one amendment we made to the protocol in the last year was to incorporate a serial tau assessment. So all participants uh, will ideally have two tau scans performed at 12 months. Uh, at the moment, we're gonna start with 100 participants of the 250, but uh, potentially we'll do more as time moves on. MRI, again, this uh, battery reflects what was done in the EPAD study. So you can see here, see here again the range of imaging uh, that is being collected um, uh, and includes some additional um, imaging uh, protocols uh, with uh, diffusion weighted imaging, resting state fMRI, uh, ASL, and so on. And the analysis will focus on uh, atrophy, cortical thickness, connectivity, vascular burden. Um, and perfusion and arterial arrival times from ASL. Neurophysiology, this is one of the very kind of novel aspects, I think, of DFP, although we do have other studies running in Oxford, um, such as the NTAD study in Shine that are using the same protocol. And this is obviously uh, looking at um, the evidence we have that uh, changes amyloid and tau lead to impaired synaptic function. Uh, and changes in, in plasticity-dependent learning memory as a result. And this may precede the neuronal death that we see later in disease. And so people have two MEG and EEG sessions, and they do a variety of tasks, high-level tasks of memory and plasticity, and then low-level um, assessments as well, so that we get a, get a really big, robust uh, data set uh, for MEG and um, EEG. In terms of wearables and devices, again, this is really extensive and has built off stuff uh, work in the pilot date in the pilot study. So in the pilot study, uh, participants uh, wore a uh, accelerometer. Uh, and we certainly found that people had more variable gait in the clinic than when they were at home. So we've expanded on that and the gait is assessed three times uh, on site. Um, and then there are seven day home monitorings as well at these points during the course of the study. Uh, there are three methodologies being used. So there is a cognitive smartphone assessments, localization, and brief mood and sleep assessments done through devices. So we're using the Miserio smartphone application, which uh, uh, consists of a collection of cognitive tasks and mood, sleep, and function ratings. And these are done at monthly intervals, but are more concentrated both at baseline and in the final month of the study. We're also inviting people in the study to do the uh, Sea Hero Quest game, which has now been played by over 4 million people. Um, and the localization data is going to be tracked throughout the study via GPS. Again, this is looking at the hypothesis that early on in AD, um, you may see a progressive disintegration of uh, your cognitive map, so your spatial navigational abilities. <laughs> 
And then ophthalmology, again, we're looking at a range of assessments. We're looking at retinal nerve fiber layer and retinal thickness uh, data, retinal vascular caliber, and progression of extracellular deposits in the retina. We're also collecting TIA samples, as I mentioned, and the ophthalmology assessments are carried out at three points during the course of the study. So that kind of gives you an overview of the assessments we're doing. Um, although we have been going since 2019, as you can see from this diagram, which uh, demonstrates recruitment and throughput activity, obviously we had uh, a big delay. Uh, we got going literally just before COVID kicked in. Um, so there were some low level assessments that we were able to keep going through the lockdown periods, but we really picked up again um, in spring of last year. And again, I think this just demonstrates when you're doing a complex study like this, where you've got so many different site visits, trying to coordinate all of those with ongoing recruitment is a, is a challenge. But I'm pleased to say the recruitment figures are now going extremely well. And this table just demonstrates where we are with recruitment. And in fact, we've probably moved on a little bit from this table and the figures now. Um, as I mentioned, we haven't been able to open the Newcastle site as yet, and we are planning to open the King site shortly. Um, and again, you can see the throughput has varied across sites, but overall, um, we are on target uh, in terms of our throughput at this point. And actually, if you look at the throughput we've got for the various sites, we're already, we're over halfway now with the Oxford site and moving forward very well with Edinburgh and Manchester. So I'm going to move forward now and talk a little bit about how initiatives like the DFP study are working with um, the Dementia Mission. So I'm sure what most of you must be aware that in 2021, um, the government announced the Life Science Vision. And this was really um, trying to highlight the fact that we had world-class science and research centers in the UK, amazing data available via the NHS. And we needed to bring all of these factors to bear to tackle some of the main healthcare questions we are facing at the moment. And I think this also, uh, the drive for this was also to build off the successes of COVID and the fact that we were able to create um, such incredible innovations during COVID with, with the vaccine. You know, we should be able to replicate this again and we should be able to use this infrastructure, this amazing infrastructure we have to manage some of our key healthcare challenges. And so uh, the government announced seven uh, missions. And you can see here that one of those was specifically around neurodegeneration and dementia. And so there was a, an, a webinar a couple of weeks ago, and this slide, these slides are, are from those, which highlights what the dementia mission is going to do. So as I said, this is recognizing huge global burden of dementia and the fact that it's a key healthcare challenge. And then there was a need to accelerate precision treatments. And here you can see the highlighted gaps um, that the Dementia Mission hopes to address. And it really reflects some of those issues um, that meant that, 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 that kind of led to the setup of the DFP study. So that inability to, to subtype and stratify early disease and to predict and monitor disease progression and have sensitive endpoints for trials. And so the Dementia Mission has three proposed arms. There is the Neurodegeneration Initiative, which is about developing innovation in biomarkers, data, and digital sciences to address those needs. It is developing a network of sites for trial readiness um, to address some of those questions I mentioned right at the start about why do we have such, so set up, such slow setup and recruitment um, within the UK at the moment. And then the third arm is uh, an Innovate UK competition, which is going to look at um, innovative biomarkers, particularly wet biomarkers uh, and uh, blood biomarkers that can feed in to the neurodegeneration initiative arm. So this is, again, I you know, apologize for using the same slides from uh, that webinar, but I think it demonstrates really well how these three arms are going to work together. So the Neurodegeneration Initiative, again, is about identifying and setting up the infrastructure to identify biomarkers for stratification, disease progression, and validation of targets. The trials network is about creating capacity to deliver those trials. And then the Innovate UK arm is about de developing even more novel biomarkers. And I think, you know, one thing that's very key about this is that it wants to build on existing infrastructure. So Masood mentioned that one of my roles is within Dementia's Platform UK. 
and I lead on a, something called the Trials Delivery Framework, which has tried to set up a network of existing sites. And we have got a lot of sites, got 20 sites on board, but I think there's a lot more that we can be doing. And this slide just demonstrates, and I'm not going to expect you to read all of the details of this, how something like the Trial Delivery Framework, the TDF, could work with this DTRC, um, DTRC network. And I think we have to start getting more creative about how and when we do these assessments. And I think as digital and blood-based uh, biomarkers are becoming more feasible, uh, we can use those as a real way of identifying people uh, very early on in, uh, to, that may be suitable for trials. And then you create, again, a kind of funnel where you gradually have levels of confirmatory biomarkers depending on uh, how well you, you need to phenotype people for individual trials. So overall, the objectives of the Neurogeneration Initiative, so this is the arm of the Dementia Mission that's about delivering those biomarkers, is to, uh, is to address these key issues, which is this inability to uh, subtype disease and stratify for trials, lack of sensitive endpoints, and lack of predictive biomarkers. And they've been very clear that um, in terms of which diseases this will focus on, it's quite agnostic. So initial focus on Alzheimer's disease, but with a move to uh, other forms of dementia as well. And in terms of um, biomarkers, again, they're very open to exploring new biomarkers and their utility for trials. And again, the focus is very much on uh, new fluid and blood biomarkers and digital biomarkers and how those can be used to deliver uh, on these gaps. So I'm going to just finish off uh, this talk with uh, a reflection on what this says about clinical services. Ultimately, as we are developing more disease modifying drugs and we are, I think, in a really good place to think about using novel biomarkers to identify people suitable for those trials, we need the clinical infrastructure to ultimately deliver the drugs. And really over the last few years, I think most uh, clinical academics have been highlighting the fact that we're really not prepared to do that in terms of clinical services within the UK and in fact, globally. And you know, a lot of these statistics will be really familiar again to everybody. We know that there are probably 50 million people worldwide affected by dementia, but those numbers are going to triple by 2050. And it's estimated there could be 20 million people over the age of 55 undiagnosed with MCI across Europe. There have been various initiatives to try and look at how prepared clinical services are. So in 2017, the Global Coalition on Aging and Alzheimer's Disease, uh, Global Coalition on Aging, sorry, and Alzheimer's Disease International developed something called the Innovation Readiness, Readiness Index for Dementia. The World Health Organization in 2018 produced guides for countries to develop their own dementia plan. And then the Davos Alzheimer's uh, Collaborative um, launched their Healthcare System Preparedness Project in 2021 which again was, how can we use novel, novel biomarkers at scale to prepare clinical services for these drugs? On top of that, we know, aside from DMTs, a lot more about risk factors and that 40% of dementias uh, could, could involve modifiable risk factors. And yet, as I said, our services still very much are focused on diagnosis in that clinical realm. So either mild cognitive impairment or dementia but they are going to need to change. And there's a growing opportunity that the public wants them to change and are interested in prevention. So uh, there's certainly a sense that the large numbers of the public, so one study recently suggested 73% of the public would agree to use smartphone tasks to monitor their day-to-day -day life if it would help prevent their risk of dementia. And 85% of the public were happy to take a test even if they didn't have um, memory impairment at this point that would tell them if they were in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. And I think this counteracts some of the concerns that clinicians have had, which is, should we be having these discussions with people? Should we be assessing for risk and biomarkers before there are licensed treatments? And my sense is that as people are becoming more aware of risk factors and lifestyle impact on risk of dementia, they actually want this information and we should be having that conversation with the public. <laughs>
So there was a paper published a few years ago, this is 2018, that looked at the preparedness of the healthcare systems in six countries. Now, this is a few years old, obviously now, but I think there's probably not been a huge shift, certainly within the UK services. And it used a simulation model to assess preparedness in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Sweden, and the UK and recognised that if we were going to deliver disease-modifying drugs, we're going to need to screen, diagnose and treat very many more people than we are now. And initially, there would probably be a backlog because you would ha have to pick up those prevalent cases that aren't currently in the clinical system. And as time went on, um, the incident cases would not be as great. So in that paper, they estimated that if disease-modifying drugs came on the market in 2020, the projected waiting times uh, varied from five months for treatment in Germany to 19 months for evaluation in France. And the first time that these individual countries would potentially have no waiting lists are here. And you can see the UK was 2042. So 22 years after the drugs hit the market, um, that's how long it may take us to have uh, services set up that actually work um, to deliver these drugs efficiently. And not surprisingly, one of the, the main rate limiting steps is specialist capacity. So whether people can do biomarkers, interpret biomarkers, but also whether they can deliver the drugs. So mindful of the fact that at the moment DMTs that we have running through trials are either delivered intravenously um, or subcutaneously, um, some are delivered intrathecally. These are not uh, drugs that are going to be delivered um, orally as things stand. So we need to have an infrastructure to deliver them as well. And what that would mean is while you had this 20 years on a waiting list, one million more people could progress from MCI to dementia. And when people have looked at data in other countries, it looks very similar. So one, one uh, statistic that was quoted was that there could be 15 million people with mild cognitive impairment in the US that have not been diagnosed. And that would equate to 50 months of wait within the US. So we really need a kind of global uh, um, approach to how we solve some of these issues. This slide is uh, from that paper. And the reason I've put it up is because it emphasizes that this data was based on CSF and PET biomarker uh, utilage and an IV drug. So again, this just demonstrates that if we get to the point where blood biomarkers or uh, an alternative um, multimodal set of biomarkers using things like retinal imaging become feasible, that means we can bring down those waiting lists. And this slide is what this could look like in clinical practice. So this was from a paper published last year by Jeff Cummings and others about what the next generation of clinical pathways may need to look like. And again, it's a really busy slide. So just to talk you through it, on the top hand uh, top of the slide, you can see the kind of steps that people would go through in terms of how they would be detected, maybe with a, an early cognitive screening test in the community, and then they would be passed on for further clinical assessment and biomarker confirmation. And then they would obviously need to be followed up post-treatment to monitor for treatment response, disease progression, and also side effects, um, uh, as we know, could be a big issue for disease modifying drugs, issues like ARIA. The bottom hand of the slide emphasizes how these novel biomarkers could really help. So blood based biomarkers and particularly digital technology could make a lot of these assessments much easier. And particularly if you start thinking about that range of digital technologies from the in clinic through to the active at home assessments through to the passive assessments, these could really help um, with some of the stages uh, of, of service development. But there are obvious challenges. Um, at the moment, the coverage and focus of service is very limited. So most people who come through memory clinics in the UK uh, will go to a memory clinic in a mental health trust. And at this point, we do not do any biomarkers at all. And we wouldn't even routinely collect, uh, take blood. So even to uh, institute blood-based biomarkers is going to be a massive change. And as I said, that includes uh, a challenge for DMT delivery if this is going to be um, via some form of infusion. And you know, even if countries outside of the UK and within the UK can absorb this increased service demand, it's going to be a challenge for them to be incentivized to scale up. And there's obviously a capacity and capability issue for clinicians. And I think because we're going to be need to be identifying people earlier on, earlier on in the clinical pathway, primary care may become a critical entry point. <laughs> 
again, I don't think I can overemphasize how important I think digital devices and blood biomarkers can be, both for early detection and ongoing monitoring. And uh, there's certainly been evidence from the literature that even a brief cognitive test plus a blood-based biomarker in primary care actually improves triaging and reduce waiting times to see specialists in current services as they are. We need to have more prognostic information to understand those early trajectories. And there are projects going on in, in countries like Italy that are gathering systematic information from people with MCI as they go through their clinical pathway. I think one of the problems we face in the UK is that for most memory clinics, we don't follow people up who are in that prodromal MCI stage. So we really lack some of that real world data uh, to understand some of the disparities between ethnic groups, different socioeconomic groups and so on. And ultimately, if we're going to use things like digital devices to look at uh, progression and response, I think telehealth platforms could be essential and again could provide the ability to have coordinated care between the patient and their care partners, whether they be in secondary or primary care. So what next for the UK? Well, some of you may be aware that there is a growing network of something called brain health clinics across the UK, and these were really set up to address some of these issues. So how can we, uh, how can we uh, more accurately diagnose people earlier in the clinical pathway? How can we help them with risk management? How can we support this underserved group that we don't currently follow up in most services? And how do we align these clinical assessments with the needs for precision recruitment into trials. And this is a network of sites as it stands. I think there's probably a couple more on the top of this network at the moment. And they have just formed into something called the Brain Health Coalition uh, with a view of um, uh, trying to develop a national strategy for uh, these services and how do we start to promote them more widely because at the moment most of these services are set up uh, in individual research teams with limited funding and limited capability to, to scale up across uh, the UK. And uh, just in the last month there was a paper published around dementia prevention um, and how uh, the U European Task Force for Brain Health Services envisaged these services should ramp out. You can see on the top right that they have highlighted in this paper what the task force feels the main pillars of brain health services needs to be, and that is about risk assessment, but also risk communication. That's something I haven't talked about, and I think, again, if we're going to be identifying people with earlier disease, whether that be for efficient diagnosis or recruitment into trials, uh, we need to uh, think carefully how we're going to communicate that early risk, personalised prevention, and then cognitive enhancement. So whether that be through disease modifying drugs, symptomatic drugs, um, or other interventions. And you can see in terms of timelines, um, they're suggesting that probably around 2025 is when we will start to see large scale clinical deployment of these types of services with a move into the more general population and low middle income countries, probably around 2030. So my final messages at the end of this webinar really are that biomarkers and changes around biomarkers, I think, are creating massive opportunities for early proof of concept trials, but also to drive these novel clinical pathways. And I think the dementia mission is an opportunity for us to support biomarker development and to think, as I said, what how these can be utilized both for trial stratification, but also clinical diagnosis. I think things like blood-based biomarkers and digital technology really provide opportunities for uh, scrutinizing uh, mechanistic um, causes uh, and, and teasing apart causative factors from early markers of disease but also investigating um, risk factors more widely. So there's a lot of recently identified risk factors like sleep, sensory loss, air pollution, a microbiome and mito mitochondrial dysfunction that we don't really understand uh, in terms of their impact on the trajectory of disease. And as I mentioned, we, we lack a lot of real world data around underrepresented groups and how things like social factors and built environments maybe affect people's risk of disease and risk of pro progression. And I think the 
the massive access accessibility of blood-based biomarkers and also potentially, as I said, some of the biomarkers the DFP study is, is looking at, like retinal imaging, which could be incredibly accessible, could really help us understand uh, those much better. And then finally, I think linking these biomarker data with big data that we ho have at our fingertips within the NHS really could help with stratification for trials, um, progression and validation um, of targets, and also diagnostic strategies over the lifespan in diverse groups. So again, one of the things I haven't really talked too much about is how these different biomarkers um, may uh, present themselves at different points in the lifespan or in, in different uh, diverse groups. And I think, you know, we have an opportunity here to think um, quite ambitiously about how studies like DFP can provide uh, unique biomarker sets that can be used to um, scrutinize a lot of these research questions as well as stratify for trials. So I'm going to end there. Thank you very much for your time um, and take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, I mean, you painted a very wide ranging picture there about what could happen. And I just wondered maybe if I kick off and please do put questions into the chat if you'd like to ask Vanessa other other questions um, about two ends of this. One is you know, doing cognitive testing, blood-based biomarkers now, but with a view to potential disease modification. And that you know is obviously going to be very expensive. We're nowhere near geared up to do anything like that in terms of intravenous infusions. But the other end of it was, you mentioned that, you know, it, sort of middle age, perhaps interventions like changing vascular risk factors, monitoring blood pressure better, all the rest of it. We could do that. You know, it, it is something and that would have a major knock on effect beyond just the brain. So what do you think about in terms of investment um, and realistic investment of what we could do for prevention? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right in that that's an area we could be doing an awful lot more. And, you know, one way to think about the investment issue is, as, you, as you've kind of suggested, how do you combine that with existing um, health assessments that we're just not tapping into very adequately? So I was on a call with a, a, primary, a primary care colleague this week where she was highlighting that there's just been, I think, new guidelines coming out from the British Heart Foundation about screening um, and the implications for screening for patients in terms of health. None of them mentioned brain health. You know, and she highlighted straight away, this is a missed opportunity in terms of a public health message, if nothing else, mm. which is, you know, what's good for your heart is good for your head, you know, this kind of broad concept. And the fact that if we started to think a little bit more um, uh, creatively about how we can utilise some of those risk assessments that we're probably already doing, particularly in primary care, which as we said, is probably where we need to be shifting our focus. Um, we could already be picking up a lot of people with these, these key risk factors for dementia and potentially managing them. And I know that's two big issues. You know, one is identifying people. Yeah. The second is what you do about it. But I think the identification, we're probably doing a lot of that. It's just about extrapolating that and thinking what, what data can we use for brain health that we're already collecting around cardiovascular risk, frailty, whatever. The managing, I think, is a big issue. I know I've been involved with some work where people are looking at things like social prescribing. You know, how do you, if you identify a risk factor, how do you help an individual manage that? But I think that probably is an area that we could invest in, at a, you know, with, and with a fairly small level of investment, get a fairly big level of return, because I just don't think we're doing it at all. Yeah, yeah. My, my own experience is that GPs are not very good at keeping blood pressure tightly controlled or, or conveying that message for brain health. And that's, that, that's a, as you say, a, a really lost opportunity. We've and I think it's about unifying things, because I think this is it. If we, get, if we try yeah. and get GPs to do endless, uh, uh, you know, um, management of different aspects and kind of messages about health on different topics, stuff will drop off the radar. It's about unifying some of this approach. Yeah. I mean, it's already something they're all, they're supposed to be doing. It's just simply conveying the message that it might also have an impact on dementia risk. Indeed. We've got a, we've got a couple of other questions here from Agar Munyap, and they ask, can you explain a bit more about telehealth? What, what are you thinking there? 
Yeah, I think um, digital platforms are becoming a big area of interest, I think, at the moment. We're recognising that digital technology presents a real opportunity to uh, give us data around cognitive assessments. As I said, a lot of these could be much more um, accurate if you're able to assess people in their own home, for instance, where they may be much more comfortable. Um, so it's really about extrapolating that and saying you could create a platform, whether it's sit on a phone app or a web-based app or something of that sort, where people can do um, ongoing cognitive assessments, assessments of their mood, assessments of their sleep. Um, maybe data is collected from passive digital devices around gate and so on. It feeds into the platform. And then from that, the patient would get some feedback on their performance. Uh, so I know Masood is also involved in a group at the moment looking at the utility of this in Parkinson's disease. And I think these type of platforms not only provide the opportunity to give feedback to patients and really engage them proactively in, in risk management, for instance, but you could have feedback to their uh, cl clinics and clinicians as well. And I think one of the concerns around managing particularly earlier disease in dementia, is just the sheer capacity issues. I mean, the reality is clinical services struggle to support people with dementia as is. Um, most, certainly in mental health memory clinics, most people are discharged very quickly back to primary care. So we're going to have to work in a coordinated way with our partners. And I think these type of platforms could provide the opportunity to feed data back to primary care, to be shared across primary and secondary care potentially even create things like virtual clinics where there is a kind of second level that patients could sit in if they're starting to um, have scores on their cognitive tasks that, that, that create concern, but maybe they don't need a face-to-face -face follow up at this stage. So I think that's what I'm thinking of is kind of the, these platforms that allow for more bespoke and remote clinical management. Great, thank you. Um, Theodora here is asking, how many IPSC lines are going to be generated? Every patient or only part of the cohort? So we've just started work on that, actually, um, with one of our industry partners. So at the moment, they're being generated in a subgroup. So we've got about 30, actually, that are just, I mean, we have the ability, as I said, we have the samples to do this across the whole, whole study, across the whole cohort. Uh, we're just piloting now a generation across about 30 samples. And we're looking at that um, alongside uh, uh risk, potential risk based on the MEG data, so susceptibility and risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, and so initially, we're going to start with a small group. Uh, we've also done it with the pilot study group, um, and then we will hopefully expand out. Maybe, Vanessa, you could also explain to the audience a little bit more about what the rationale for generating IPSC lines is from individual patients in this in this deep and frequently phenotype cohort. I mean, I think um, you know, it gives us the opportunity to understand whether risk that we perceive in vivo is matched with in vitro outcomes. And I think, you know, we have so many other biomarkers. If we're able to identify um, changes within those IPSC lines, that really gives us a chance to understand how many of those biomarkers are actually effective at um, assessing risk in, in patients in real life. And potentially also screening drugs that might alter the biology. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I think, you know, that that's a brave new world if that ever happens. But um, that is personalized medicine. Indeed. Yeah. 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 OK. Um, any other questions? Don't be shy. All right. If not, thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, it's a fantastic uh, description of what DP UK is doing with the deep and frequent a phenotyping cohort and let's hope recruitment improves over the next few years indeed i mean i think it again it proves that we can deliver this kind of range of assessments the fact that we've been able to get the study going and recruitment is now going well and hopefully i can come back with some data in the future great thanks a lot thank you thanks also to the audience thank you